Hello and welcome to Things Left Unsaid talk series for the 17th Architecture Biennale titled, How Will We Live Together? Or is it more appropriate to ask, how will we not live together, especially with the post-pandemic considerations? We are the hosts. I am Wendy Falk. And I am Diana Bogosi. This is a series of interviews with a number of scholars, practitioners, innovators, policymakers, and curators to put forward several questions and concerns regarding the relationship of data and future of our cities. Things Left and Said is also about the people living in the cities, such as citizens, how people curate the cities in the context of cultural and social impact, and also how individuals build our cities in terms of architects, urban policymakers, and innovators. For this series, we also ask the same questions to all of our guests. Now we welcome Paula Antonin. Welcome, Paula. It's an absolute honor to have you join us today. And our first question is, what is the definition of a city to you? And how has this definition influenced your work? It's, uh, it's people being together and building ways to be together. So it really is very tied to the 17th Biennale in a way, because uh, buildings and sewage and subways come to come afterwards, right? The first engine is togetherness and everything else then is set up for that. And that's why I believe that cities will, will last forever. Uh, New York in particular, you have it, you see it beyond me, behind me. It's truly about being together. And how has a city or the definition of a city evolved since the beginning of your career? And how does, how does that actually play a part in you? If you think of the city as people coming together, it never changes. What changes are the circumstances? What changes are the tools for being together? So even during the pandemic, when I was, I, I spent it in New York City, the city was the city, it didn't change. It changed tremendously because we were isolated at home, because there were, there were tumbleweeds on 55th between six and seven. I mean, it changed tremendously, but the heart and the soul of it remained the same. I tend to have this very abstract approach to anything that deals with architecture and design because maybe it's my training because uh, when I studied at, at the Polytechnic of Milan, we were too many to do anything practical. So we got like the best theoretical training. So to me, it's always seen from angel's eye view, even more than a bird's eye. So um, if you think of the city that way, it's never changed. It is the same in its myriad manifestations. It deals with change, it rolls with the punches, and uh, it's, it's perennial. So I guess that you kind of answered what is a post-pandemic city to you. Do you think there is a, a future of change? Do you see like the consistency of coming it back or... Well, you know, I answered and I did not answer, right? So I answered in this very abstract and general terms, but in truth, the changes have been dramatic. And um, uh, you know, about, uh, we're, we're recording this at the beginning of August 2021, and in May 2020, I started a project that I really am very passionate about together with Alice Rothstorn, who's one of my greatest friends and arguably the best design critic alive. We started this project on Instagram Live that's called Design Emergency, design.emergency. And we were inspired by Fat Joe. I was watching Fat Joe every night doing his Instagram Live and I was thinking, <laughs> wow, we can, we can do the same. And since Alice and I have been doing the same thing forever, which is to try and explain to people that design is not only cute chairs, but it's really pretty much everything. Um, you, in a way, you have to set your own limit. You know, like I set my own limit at something that cannot involve any of the of the senses, right? That's my own mental limit. But you can go on forever, planning, strategy, etc. So, it's our goal. It's always been our goal to explain that design is not prettification, that design is not something you add on top like whipped cream and cherries. No, it is intrinsic. It's a geopolitical force. And so the pandemic was the perfect example, right? Um, 
don't throw away a good crisis. So we started with the acute problems of that time. We started with the design of ventilators and PPE. Then we moved into the vaccination effort. And now we're thinking about, we're taking the elan of the pandemic to think of the future, right? So the post-pandemic city is incredibly important. Now, what, there's been many changes. And every time there's a pandemic, there are changes that remain. Most of them, any kind of momentous, even wars, I mean, most of them are good changes or they seem good because it's been so bad before. But so I'm, I'm tr we're trying to think, we're thinking about it right now. What will the positive changes and silver linings that will remain, especially in the city? And, um, well, there are some obvious ones, right? So the bike lanes, for instance, the fact that there's been so many pop-up lanes that hopefully will remain. You know, in New York City, there was, um, there are some, tell me if I speak too much, but uh, there's been incredible statistics about people that have started biking for the first time. And in Chicago, bike share programs went up 51%. Um, one of the people that did not bike that much before and instead I elected I, I was going to MoMA throughout the pandemic because I was part of the crisis management team Alice is going to laugh because I always say crisis management team I wanted to have my jacket with it on it but you know I was taking the bike all the time so bike lanes are one example low emissions I'm, not, I'm afraid we won't be able to keep them but there are these amazing images of blue skies in Beijing and Delhi and you know I don't know if that will be able to retain and then there are the temporary that risk becoming permanent uh, there was um, an op-ed in the New York Times about 10 days ago by Dan Doktorov who used to be the deputy mayor in, during the Bloomberg administration and is now at Alphabet you know Google and um, he was talking about the need to tear down the temporary structures of restaurants. And, you know, my, my knee-jerk reaction is always to say, just get out of it. Don't mind your own business, right? You know, you're not in the administration anymore. But I think he has a little bit of a point because these structures have become basically permanent. So um, what gives, right? Uh, are they temporary or you know because in Italy of course you have restaurants in the street but they are not garden sheds you know that are close to the elements so it's it's fascinating but to me one of the big question marks of the post pandemic city there are many but to me one of the biggest question marks is the street fronts especially in New York City um, street fronts have gone through a, through a lot during this pandemic um, of course Shops had closed, um, everything was deserted, many went out of business. Then there was the opportunistic looting by non-Black Lives Matter protesters. I want to stress it here. That happened in Maine, New York City. And afterwards, there was the boarding up with wood planks and then um, the sense of like complete dystopia. Then the artists painting on the wood planks, then the nonprofit taking the wood planks once the emergency was over and giving them to restaurants to make temporary uh, structures. So there was this whole exchange, but still there are so many empty storefronts. And um, in a city like New York, street life is, what it, is where it's at. So I think it's really fascinating and I would like to involve architecture schools, maybe they're already doing it, in thinking of what to do with these spaces. Um, you know, once upon a time, the entropy sign was banks taking over right. spaces where, where vibrant stores used to be. And now not even the banks want them. So what, what are we going to do, right? Can it be a cafe society? So can workplaces move there? I, I don't know, but it's a, it's a really fascinating question. Yeah, and much more, because you know uh, what? I would like to talk to people from other cities and you probably have, and there's a lot to discuss. As you mentioned, Looking at New York City as a case study has been fascinating for architects and designers and creatives for many, many decades. If we're only speaking in terms of amount of data available from New York City, definitely in terms of, let's say, social sciences, New York City has been leading the way. But as you mentioned, it's also important to uh, expand our idea of innovative cities and look at other case studies and um, other contexts in order for us to really lead and 
imagine innovation in this area? Absolutely. You know, we tend to be very self-referential in New York because we love the city, but that kind of self-centeredness is is wrong because, true, there are other labs in the world. I mean, Italy tends to be quite permanent. Change happens very slowly here. Um, some stores might have closed, but they'll reopen, right? And uh, it's not like the immediate reaction that you have in New York City, but I would really like to know like the changes that are happening in China that I am um, getting information about in a very filtered way, because unfortunately I don't speak or understand Mandarin, but the, um, the rebalancing with the countryside without any romanticism, but really fueled by social media and also by the pandemic is incredibly interesting. I don't think that the, there's, there's an exodus, an irreparable exodus from the cities to the countryside anywhere in the world, because cities are attractive by definition, they're magnets, right? So, but I find really interesting this redistribution of uh, individuals that might be milking cows, but still have a very urban or city attitude towards the dissemination and communication of their cow milking, right? They're influencers on their own in, in China. So it's fascinating. So there is this, the actual city, and then there's the city that you bring with you wherever you go. For over two decades, your curatorial work at MoMA and beyond has focused on the relationship between nature, data, and intelligence to question how we design everything from object scale all the way up to cities. For instance, design and the last of mind or talk to me exhibitions were fundamental dialogues between objects, design, and the construction of cities, and especially in this case, smart cities. I say before many of these terms were even defined or overused in the field. We also have been looking at the definition of cities um, from the lens of Saskia Assassin. She refers to cities as complex yet open ended systems. And she often uses open source analogy to advocate the construction of new cities. In this context, you have nurtured how creatives think of cities through a critical perspective with introspective curation. So how do you think architects, urban policymakers, designers, and creatives in general can better use data in urban strategic design? Data is so important, and it's always been, even before the digital revolution or evolution, and even before artificial intelligence, we gather data in different ways. But, you know, if you look at the history of data visualization, it goes back centuries. So data is incredibly important, but it starts with data sets. So I think that in a way, um, it's very important to elaborate data in a smart way, and that's when designers come into play, but also the choice of data sets matters a lot. And I think that more attention must be given to that. Like some data visualization designers, for instance, you know, Georgia Lupi, she makes her own data, but you know, she's, I don't know if you're familiar with her work, she's based in New York, she's Italian, she has this great theory of data humanism and small data. So she clearly has a position that maybe is not very useful to policymakers, but it gives a sense of what data visualization is. She makes her own data sets. Instead, there's another Italian visualization designer, Federica Fragapane, she's excellent. She instead works with data sets that are given to her, for instance, from the Surgo Foundation, who took the CDC vulnerability index, added a few uh, vulnerability to COVID, added a few elements that they thought would be important to help policymakers a lot numbers of vaccines at the beginning of the rollout campaign. So data sets matter. And that's also where you have the most political influence possible. So it's important also to monitor the way data sets, not only to choose them, but to monitor how they're chosen. And then, you know, you're familiar with the whole elaboration, but that's the source. Then there's the delivery methodology. And that's where designers are incredibly important because Data visualization is like reportage. It's never objective, no matter what people tell you. The way you choose to highlight a word 
or a certain line of data makes a difference. So I think that it would be very important for the world at large, from public opinion to more expert policymakers or scientists, etc., to understand what data visualization really is. Because it's a language and it's an important language that we should all learn, like we should all learn to program a little bit, right? So it's a contemporary language that needs to be at least uh, presented for some basic literacy. You don't have to be fluent, but at least you need to know that what you're looking at. That actually brings quite well into our second question on the issues of uh, open source analogy and the role of data management and policy making in this conversation. How, how do you see that and what is the trajectory? Or perhaps how do you see the role of public literacy, which you actually just uh, uh, advised on that. So issues of data management and policy making, and perhaps how the public should be utilizing it. Data management, policy making, data production is similar to information. It is public information of a different kind. And even in that case, it has the problems that also public information is finding. It has some fake news too, the possibility or the danger of fake news. It has lobbying um, entities, you know, so many, so many of the data sets that are offered to policymakers come from foundations like the Surga Foundation. So if you know that that foundation steers towards the liberal, that means that if you are a conservative politician, you will not want to even look at that data. So it really is fascinating because there needs to be also the same kind of public pressure that is applied to information, applied also to data. But that won't happen until there is more awareness of the incredible power of data. So that's what I really feel. We should look at data as if it were another kind of information besides television or besides print or besides uh, individual and more partisan websites. So how do you think... Um, do you agree with that? Does it make sense? Does it make yeah, sense totally. to you? I think, I think it really does. Okay. And I think there's there's a larger discussion on... And I really actually like the, the way you're actually discussing about the larger issues also with um, how people are looking at data as a language. I think you're probably the only one that actually thought of it this way. Um, but it's also, it's interesting in, in terms of when you, when you mention how people are consuming data, one aspect of it is also you know, the, the kind of translation of information, the diversifying of who looks at the data set, right? Um, I think if I recall uh, quite interestingly, I think Stephanie Dinkins, um, fellow artist, uh, is, is interesting in, in programming the AI on that. But in, in that also same vein, like how do we leverage privacy issues and how do you think the, or what is the importance of technology in cities for you? Does it go hand in hand? In privacy terms of that? is a huge problem and frankly insurmountable. I think it's going to stay with us forever. I don't, I'm sorry to be so pessimistic and so skeptical, but I don't see how we can protect ourselves. Maybe to decentralize um, the power to provide data and to provide information, but we're so reliant on so many of these companies that gather our data and we have so few means of protecting ourselves that you know the European Union can scream to the heavens, but um, the power of big tech is such and the way democracy is going in the world is such that I have very, very few hopes. The only thing that we can do is to arm ourselves as individuals and it's going to become like a rat race, like a rabbit. You know, you, you try to get me and I and I go faster. But, you know, I, at one point I used to say, well, I have nothing to hide. But that's such a that's such a lame way to put it. Yes, I have something to hide <laughs> or at least I should be paid for what gets used, maybe, maybe, maybe the, uh, you know, the, the, the whole idea of the blockchain and NFTs, maybe it can be deployed in such a way as to at least monitor the, very, the veracity and perhaps also the remuneration that should come with data. But I don't know. I think it's a, 
it's a gigantic, wicked problem. And I'm glad that the best minds on earth are working at it. I feel completely unequipped to do that. I'm going to do my part by highlighting ways in which we can visualize what goes on. Because, you know, when you visualize a problem, then you can also, especially if it's data visualization, perhaps you can find some patterns and also think of a way to manage it. But boy, I, it's really difficult. Do you, do you think there's a hackability aspect to it? Is it an important feature for cities and data or as a separate entity? The hackability issue. It's, uh, it's, well, the hackability issue is a gigantic problem for, for all. Um, you know, right now I'm just thinking of something as stupid as the vaccination passes. You know, I am speaking to you from Italy, where the vaccination pass got um, in, got enforced last Friday, and already there are fake passes everywhere. So it really is an issue that uh, has to do with all the different facets. I'm talking about something that is about the health system, but we've seen also what's happened with private companies. We've seen what happens with pipeline. I mean, hackability is a gigantic issue and ultimately you know what it comes down to once again is human beings honesty and character and oh my god that's really you know it's at the same time rock solid and also absolutely quick sense yeah i so. really i really like how you mentioned the issue of digital property and how i mean also i think you're the only one that's also brought into the discussion of like how blockchains could be you know integral in that larger discussion of the discourse between we real and digital property and how these things could coexist. But that's probably a whole different talk. It is and it isn't. We've been talking a lot about NFTs, right? And about, you know why? It, it is because we're not going to delve on it more, but whenever there's a new or relatively new technology, there's this moment of drunkenness where you mm -hmm. see people throwing it at the wall and see what sticks. But I always know that sobriety is going to set in and that technology is going to become somehow super useful. Maybe not immediately, maybe in a while. So I have great faith in the blockchain. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> now, moving away from cities and more into your work and the working methodology, often the journey between research and dissemination, whether it's publication or what's the exhibition curation, this journey is often very, very long and influenced by many, many external factors. And uh, in this context, could you talk uh, a little bit about what is left out? We're very much um, interested in what um, maybe barely makes it to the footnote, what is left out of an exhibition or a publication. You have famously put together uh, interactive websites or exhibitions, so we're curious about the the process of documentation and archival in your work. Yeah, it's 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 funny you should bring that up because I had that feeling a long time ago, like in 2011, I did this exhibition talk to me. And I, I, I had the same feeling, like, you know what you need as a curator, it's your job to synthesize and distill and present something that's cooked uh, to your public, but there might be some weirdos that wanna know more. So I started a blog at the very beginning of the research process together with the curatorial assistants that were working with me on in which we put everything that we were looking at, even things that in the end we did not put in the exhibition. So they were all there. And then we had the confirmed one. We had the research, the bibliography. And I did it also for other exhibitions. So it's still there. Um, and That's actually, remarkable. If you go to the, no, so the Talk To Me website, the last time I tried to access the blog, I could not really access it. And so I had to tell, ask MoMA what the deal is. But at the end of the exhibition, we also published mini bios of all the people that were involved in the show, the carpenters, the uh, painters, we wanted to show people how an exhibition really comes together from beginning to end. So I, I hear what you say. We've done the same for the Triennale di Milano for Broken Nature. There was, I think it's still there, brokennature.org. And even in that case, we had 
all the research, the bibliography, the articles we were looking at. Um, and uh, I, right now for, for um, Design Emergency, Alice and I are working on the book. We have a pretty hefty bibliography, but of course we can't put everything in there, but in a way the Instagram feed remains as um, a documentation. But I agree with you. The problem is that in, in the digital age, we feel that we can assemble. Like I started the MoMA website in 1995 with my first show there because I wanted to have the checklist on the record and it's still there. And I remember Laurie Hawkinson, you've been at Columbia, so you know Laurie. I remember a few years ago, not so long ago, said, Paula, it's so great, the checklist is there. I'm like, yeah, I, I coded <laughs> it myself. It's like horrible, but it's there. And um, so this idea of accumulating knowledge Maybe one day we will be able to really rely on an AI search that enables us to get everywhere. But even now, if you search for something, it takes you forever to screen between the credible essays and what the search engines want you to see. So I believe that it's okay to accumulate all this knowledge. And I believe that one day... <laughs> something will help us. Said like a true researcher. <laughs> yes. Thank you. We're also curious, how have people misunderstood or misused your research? So in the sense the, the reflections, maybe after an opening, after a publication, and sometimes this misreadings can be actually informative. No, oh, I, I don't, I don't recall it happening. It's funny, but I, I have this attitude wherever, whenever I release something in the world, it's everybody's. So I haven't monitored the uses of my research. Uh, it's a very interesting question. I feel that I have so much to do. I, it, it really, I don't know that I would want to deal with that. But nothing has come back to haunt me yet <laughs> so good do, do you think that um there's a subjectivity of your way of interpreting information and like what and that's what's left out of that inspirational process absolutely 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 so um i at mom i also run this r d department and i um i do these salons that i'm really really proud of so i'm gonna plug them here just google moma r and d and you're gonna get to the website they're fantastic so the whole idea is to present the museums as the r d of society so um museums can help you not only look at art but also think about death think about aging and the very first salon was about curating I had there, there's always four speakers, um, so the speakers were uh, a bona fide curator, the, the chief curator of painting and sculpture of MoMA and Temkin, then there was Maria Popova who, from Brain Pickings, who is a literary critic and at that time used to call herself curator of interestingness, which was fascinating. Then there was Jeff Jarvis, who was a journalist and professor of journalism at CUNY, who at that time was saying that a journalist can also curate sources. And then the last one was Tor Hermansen, who is a music producer for Stargate Music. That's this company in Scandinavia that does big hits for Beyonce and Rihanna. So he was talking about curating beats that he found online from kids that uploaded them. And so four very different perspectives plus myself, but we all distilled two principles in common. Curators are trusted guides, so they don't pretend to be objective. They present their viewpoint in an honest way and people can decide based on their track record whether to follow them or not. And secondly, curators need an audience. So we're performers. Without an audience, we do not exist or we're artists. So, so it really is about that. So definitely my view is always subjective, but honestly so. And people, I expect that people do the same. They also look at different data and I'm one of those data sets. So then they distill their own opinion and knowledge. No, that's that's very key on that. I think this is the last question that we have for you. So what would you what would be one question that you wished you would be asked about your work that has not been asked? So I like to say that I'm more comfortable with objects than with people. 
But the truth is that I love the world so much that I'm motivated by that. So I wish somebody asked me what the role of love is in my work. You know, I, I, I like what Georgia talks about when she talks about data humanism. In order to communicate to people, we dehumanize ourselves a little bit or we make ourselves, it's a little corny to talk about work, about love, but sometimes, you know, it's what really gets to the heart of the message, right? So I wish somebody asked me for that. I think I would gush like a true Italian. I would just like start. It would be interesting. <laughs> and if we were to ask you that, what would your answer be? It really is what motivates me and it's love for, I, mean, I tend to be, uh, whenever I see something that strikes me, I want to hug it. And I say it because it can be a person, an animal, or even an object. I tend to really have this gush of love that is what motivates my curiosity. Then one of the most amazing artists for me is this um, uh, artist from Los Angeles who died unfortunately this photographer Laura Aguilar and I actually showed her work as much as I could in Broken Nature and elsewhere she was um, fabulous and she really had this kind of panic you know of love of everything she has this self portraits of herself and her body was fantastic not perfect but fantastic in front of boulders in front of rocks and the body and the rock really speak to each other. And she said that she used to identify with boulders and I would like to hug her and the boulder, right? So um, I really feel this inner fire that gets me going. Great. Thank you, Paula. It's super to have you. And of course. also for your generosity of time as well as your advocacy for so, so many types of research. It's, it's just been remarkable. Uh, we also look thank you. To... Thank you for waking up so early. Oh no, it's all good. Uh, <laughs> we're alive. <laughs> Why not? Uh, we are like yeah. also looking forward to like pairing uh, any of this information and interview with the recommended readings. We're also going to highlight the links that you've messaged. So um, yeah, so the audience could actually learn more about your current research. Also, I think we would be very excited to disseminate this information. Thank you. That's great. I'm thank gonna you so send much. You all the links so you can yes, add them. Yes, we would. Okay. <laughs>